Good morning. Good to be in the house of God this morning, right? Are we ready to have some fun? Turn to somebody say, no, don't be acting churchy. <laughs> you ain't gonna get no churchy from me this morning. You know, I know we're in church, but we don't have to be churchy, do we? Can we just be ourselves? Can we be real and authentic and original and just be who God's called you to be? So don't be getting all stuffy. I've been in, my, been in church my whole life. And so, you know, I've been bored a lot of my life. We, we shouldn't be bored in church, should we? No, oh, it should be a place where we have fun and uh, enjoy worshiping Jesus, lifting up the name of Jesus. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, my, my, my wife is with me. We've been married 35 years. Laura, stand up and give them the wave. Glad she was able to come. Uh, P Pastor Becky said, you know, for 20 years, we've been, you know, in around 50 churches a year throughout the world. I am, I don't know if y'all know it or not, I am pound for pound the happiest evangelist you know. <laughs> no one enjoys what they do more than me. I, 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 I you know, two thirds of God is go. And so I got a lot of go in me. And so we, we love what we do. And, uh, you know, I know so many men and women of God. I know so many pastors, dear friends. I, I, I know so many just great ministers, so many. But there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of generals of faith. And your pastors, Sam and Becky, they are generals of faith. Come on, give them a hand clap. And when I think about this pulpit I'm standing behind, it's very, uh, it's very, it's, it's just very humbling. When I think about the, the great generals of faith that have stood uh, in this church over the decades, it's very, very humbling. So uh, praise God. It's going to be good. We spent yesterday with uh, Paul and Debbie Troquel and had a, had a good time. You know, Brother Paul, Miss Debbie. Now, just to let y'all know so we can get something clear, we love them more than you do. <laughs> he was my youth pastor when I was 13 years old. I mean, I worked for him for four years in Magnolia. We've been best friends ever since. The only person in here that I will permit to love them more than Laura and I, you know, I guess, would be his daughter back there. And so... <laughs> Abby, Abby gets to love them more. Joe, sorry, you don't. Um, we've known them longer than, than you have, but we love them. They're, they're preaching this morning for a real dear friend of mine in uh, Forney, Texas, Pastor Marty and Mila Reed, and so uh, they're having a good time. Amen? Amen. All right, let's, let's get into some things. Um, would it be all right with y'all? Oh, let me say this real quick. Uh, Miss Charlene is back there at our table. There's some materials back there that'll bless you. Um, ask her, find out about those very unusual bags that are back there. We kind of do something that's kind of unheard of. Um, and especially if you're married, and especially if there's something on the inside of you that jumps when someone says, blessed to be a blessing. Um, and so that's all back there. Now let's get back to a question I want to ask you. Would it be all right with you today if a bunch of people got healed? Would someone, got, would someone get offended if you got healed? You know, sometimes people do. They don't want to get healed. They wouldn't have anything to talk about. They wouldn't have anything to complain about. And so today, we're going to, we're, you're going to get healed whether you want to get healed or not. I'm going to mess up your little red wagon. Do you think it's possible that everyone could be healed today? Yes. I mean, the Bible says all things are possible if we'll just... Yes. You have a brother Philip, what if they don't? Well, what if they do? <laughs> yeah, but brother Philip, you don't understand. What if not everyone gets healed today? But just what if they do? Come on, what kind of church is Life United? What if they don't get healed church or what if they do get healed church? Somebody say, I'm getting mine. I'm getting mine. You know, the thing would be, if, we were, if we're going to see God move in a way that's that way, 
And let's just say you walk out of the doors today and you say to yourself, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen that many people healed that easy. How would something like that happen? Well, I think, first of all, we'd have to understand there's a need. Everywhere I go, I'm very acutely aware of how much pain is around me. Right now in this service, so many of you are in pain. You're sore, you're stiff, you got inflammation, injuries, arthritis, you're hurting. And you know what? You came to church anyway. Some of you have been hurting so long, you don't even remember what it's like not to hurt. And some of you, the devil's lied to you and told you, you just need to be thankful because other people have it worse. You need to tell that devil to shut up. How many of you, on some level, pain, soreness, stiffness, right now, you have some sort of, of pain in your body? Lift your hands all over the place. Keep them up. Everybody look around. Look at all the hands that are up. I ain't here. Uh, this ain't about a show. I want you walking out of this place today pain free. How many of you have, have pain in your back? Where's all the you know, pain in your back? What about your neck? Who's got arthritis in your body? Wave at me. Just uh, hands and yeah. Come on, who's got a bad shoulder? Who's got a knee or knees, plural? Issues with your feet? Come on. I mean, you don't understand this. I, mean, I know we all look good, but you've got all these people that are sitting here. Some of them are squirming because it's hard for them to get comfortable because they're hurting so bad. Some of them, every day when they get out of bed, they don't know what kind of day they're going to have because they don't know if the pain level is going to be a three or it's going to be a seven. We're going to do something about that today? We're going to have to come into agreement on a couple of things. Number one is the fact that none of you deserve to be healed. So if the devil lies, tells you you're not going to be healed today because you don't deserve it, well, just agree with him because we don't deserve to be healed. It's all by God's amazing grace. It's not because of what we do. It's because of what Jesus did at Calvary. Can I get an amen? amen. So let's take the deserve out of it. And then, um, you know, the second thing is let's come into agreement that uh, Brother Philip's not going to be asking God to heal anybody today. I don't do that. Why would I ask God to do something he's already done? What part of by Jesus stripes were we healed do we not understand? It ain't about trying to get God to do something. He's already done it. What we're going to do is reach out with our faith today and receive what he's already done for us at Calvary. And let me say this with all authority. Every one of you in here have enough faith to receive your miracle today. You have enough. Now, the, the, the last thing is this. How do I receive my healing? How, how can you make sure you get your healing? Well, I got to tell you my story. It's one of the most greatest gifts God's ever given me. He gave me this story. He gave me this moment in life, and it changed my life. And everywhere I go, I tell this story. Next time you see me, I'll probably tell this story. Don't walk up to me and say, you told that story last time. I, I'll be 90 years old telling this story all over the world. So are, are, we, are we in agreement on that? So how many of you want me to tell that story? Well, Y'all smart, because every time I tell this story, people get healed. Amen? Branham called it a no-choice anointing. You're getting healed, and you have no choice. <laughs> there was a lady. She was sitting right back there. Now, it wasn't this church. Every church has right over there. <laughs> and her daughter walked up to me and said, um, well, you come pray for my mama. Or her knees messed up. And so it was after church, so I walked back there. And uh, she had turned a chair around and she had her leg in the chair. And so uh, I'm praying for her and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, I want you to watch her. I'm going to show you something. I heard, God, I'm going to watch her, watch her. And so I'm watching her and uh, I get through praying in Jesus' name, amen. And I'm watching. And then I saw what God wanted me to see, change my life. I said, what, what, what did you see? What did you see? Well, she never moved her knee. She just thanked me for praying for her. She's a real sweet lady. Thank me for praying for her, but she never moved her knee. Why didn't she move her knee? She didn't believe she was healed. If she'd have believed she was healed, what would she have done? She'd have given that thing a test wiggle. She didn't want to be healed. She just wanted me to pray for her. 
I didn't come here today to pray for you. I want you healed. But in order for you to be healed, you've got to do what that woman didn't do. If you've got a bad neck, when, not if, when, what are you going to have to do to find out your neck's healed? If you've got a bad back, what are you going to do to find out? If you've got a bad elbow, what are you going to do? Got a bad shoulder, what do you? Got a, for every one of you, it's different. There's going to come a moment in this service. Glory, God's already here. You're going to move, and it's going to be OMG, LOL. <laughs> it's gone. I'm addicted to the look in people's eyes when they realize the pain is gone. Amen? Um, years ago, I was in Israel. We were ministering in Akko, uh, Harvest of Asher Church, Guy Cohen, and uh, Messianic Church. It was an awesome time, and then we, um, we found ourselves two days in the old city. And uh, if you put that picture up, that I, that I gave you, it was in the old city. That's me standing at the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. And uh, for 2,000 years, people have been coming to that wall from all over the world. And, and there's so much blood, so much intercession that the glory would come back to that Temple Mount. Praying for the glory. That's as close as they can come to the Temple Mount without... That's as close as they can come. And they're praying that the glory would come back to that temple mount. Well, I'm standing there, but that's not what I'm praying. I'm not praying that the glory would come back to the temple mount. I'm praying for a greater glory in God's churches. That, 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 that's what's happening right there. I'm praying for, how many of you want to see a greater glory in God's churches? How many of you believe we need a greater glory in God's churches? Come on, a greater glory than the Welsh Revival, a greater glory than Azusa, a greater glory than the Voice of Healing and all those great ministers like Branham and A. A. Allen and Jack Coe and Gordon Lindsay and, oh my, Vern Jackson and little David Walker and uh, Jerry B. Walker and Catherine Kuhlman and Brother Hagen and Lester Summerall and all the, come on, a greater glory. How many of you want to see a greater glory? We're going to come together at the end of this service in unity and in faith and with, come on, with a passion on the inside of us and we're going to cry out for what? A greater glory. Ooh, I'm believing God today that today for you and for this church, a great season ends and a greater season begins. How many of you will believe with me on that? Amen? Turning your Bible over to John, the second chapter, John 2. John, the second chapter. I love this chapter. I love this story. Y'all know the story. It's the wedding at the Cain of Galilee. All right. Jesus is there. He's there with his disciples. And uh, he, he's mentoring them. He's teaching them. He's coaching them. He's pouring into them. Wedding. Mm, everybody's having fun. Mama, mama. Here comes mama. Here comes mama. <laughs> Baby, they've run out of wine. Woman, what have I to do with you? My time has not yet come. She won't even pay him no attention. She looks at these servants. She said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Does that sound like a mama? <laughs> Jesus says, take six water pots, fill them up, fill them up, fill them up. They do what he tells them to do. He says, now take the first, dr first dip and go give it to the governor, the ruler of the feast. Y'all know what happens next. The dude drinks the, drinks the water that was turned into wine stops the procession, stomps the break, gets the bridegroom over there and said, but, but his mind was blown. Mind was blown. He said, listen, I've been to so many weddings. Everybody brings out the good wine first. And then people start getting drunker and drunker and drunker. When people are really drunk, then they bring out the bad wine. Is that what he said? He said, but not you guys. Y'all saved the best for last. And then verse 11, one of my favorite scriptures. He says, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested forth his glory. Come on, somebody say glory. Glory. I came here today with three prophetic words for you that can launch us into that greater glory. Because listen, the glory is where the miracles are. It's where the gifts of the Spirit are. 
those utterance gifts, those power gifts, those revelation gifts, those signs and wonders. It's in the glory, that revival, that awakening, that habitation that you guys are looking for, that Shreveport needs, that Louisiana needs. Come on, I'm a Louisiana boy. I married a Shreveport girl. Northwood, right over there. <laughs> that America needs. We, need. we need that greater glory. But there's these three words that we've got to grab hold of. So here's the first word. Turn to somebody and say focus. I want you leaving here today with a laser focus more than you've ever had in your life to be who God's called you to be, do what God's called you to do, and be right in the middle of that glory. And you say, well, why, why, why that word focus? That's a big word in that story. You know, when Jesus uh, was sitting there and mama walks up to him and says, uh, they have no wine. And he said, uh, woman, what is, do I have to do with you? Did, didn't that, does that come across a little rude to you? Have you ever read that and went, hmm, a little rude? I, I know I could have never said woman. <laughs> Glenda Baker, my mama. <laughs> What'd you say, baby? I said mama. <laughs> right? Did it come across a little rude? Oh, what was going on there? I'll never forget when the Holy Ghost cracked that open for me. Jesus is 12 years old, jailbreak. They have to turn around three days back to Jerusalem. They find him talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Son, where are you? Where have you been? Bye, 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 bye. What did Jesus say? He said, Mama, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Is that right? That was one focused little 12 year old, wasn't it? Was that one focused little 12 year old? How focused do you think he was at 30? That's what she ran into that day. The days of her being uh, his baby boy were over. He wasn't a carpenter's son anymore. He had been baptized in the River Jordan. It was time to, it, 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 it was on. The only thing he was going to be doing every minute, every hour, every day was doing what the father told him to do. Y'all with me? She ran into the most focused 30-year-old individual in the history of the world. I'm not asking you to be more focused than Jesus at 30, but can you be more focused than a 12-year-old Jesus? We're living in an hour where we've got to be more focused than we ever have been. This is not the hour to get distracted. And everywhere I go throughout God's churches, people are distracted. All the social media and the CNN and the Fox and the MSNBC and Facebook Messenger. And, 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 and oh, you must read this before it's taken down. And, and all that stuff. We're distracted. And listen, I believe we should be informed. I believe we should pray. And I believe we should vote. But we shouldn't be We need to be focused. I'm not asking you to be more focused than a 30-year-old Jesus, but can we be more focused than a 12-year-old Yeah, but it's Jesus, 12. But he's the Messiah, the Christ, 12. Focused. Focused. You know what we've got throughout the world in God's churches? We've got a bunch of spiritual rubberneckers. And who in here knows what a rubbernecker is? What happens on the highway? Come on, when your head turns to see the carnage on the side of the road, your foot comes up off the gas puddle. That's what people are doing in the churches. They're distracted by the carnage on the side of the road instead of having their eyes where? Second word. Somebody say this word. Everybody say risk. risk. Not the game. Come on, R-I-S-K, risk. There, there are no miracles without risk. There are no signs and wonders without risk. Everything you're looking for in the glory, revival, this awakening, it's not going to happen in your comfort zone. That story is all about risk. When Jesus, whatever he said, whatever he prayed over those six water pots, he didn't say, everybody close your eyes for a moment. Oh, good, it's wine. Okay, now go serve it. He didn't, he didn't say, hey, Peter, come here. Peter, uh, I'm going to distract everybody, and you stick your finger in the wine and see if, it's, if, see if it's something other than water. Is that what he did? No, what did he do? Go give the first dip to the governor of the feast. 
That's risk. Supernatural things don't happen in your comfort zone. People always want to say, you know, the devil's the greatest threat to the church. And hey, I get that. I get that. That's kind of a no-brainer. That's low-hanging fruit. But let's be more specific. Uh, when you're in 50 churches a year and you've been doing it for 20 years and then you grew up in church your whole life, one of the greatest threats to the church is the comfort zone. We love our comfort zone, especially in America. Why do you think people in Shreveport and Bossier are staying away from churches in droves? Because everything about a church violates their comfort zone. They get up when they want to, don't want to get up. They got to wear stuff they don't want to wear. They, want to, they got to see people they don't want to see. Got to hear music they don't want to hear. They're going to hear somebody preach to them and confront them with the word that they don't want to be confronted. And then they're told when they're dismissed. But see, that's the thing. You say, well, that's not us. I'm here. I, you're here. Turn to somebody and say, you're here. But what happens is when we get in the church, then we find our comfort zone in the church. Yes. Pastor Becky, will, will you do me a favor, Pastor Becky? Will you, will you just stand up right where you are? Look around the church. Are there a lot of people sitting where they always sit? <laughs> I'll tell you right now, this is my seat. I walked in this church one day and somebody was sitting in my seat and I walked to the usher and I said, I don't know what's going on, but that's my seat. <laughs> now you better get that person out. That's my seat. I've been sitting here for 30 years. <laughs> I don't give a rip where your seat is. Where's your place? I, I, in the name of Jesus, y'all are all gonna have to deal with the horror of starting to come to church and have to sit in a different seat every time. Because people have done took your seat. Listen, when it's all said and done, you're not going to want your Christianity defined by what chair you sat in. We all need to get a little we all need to get a little Zacchaeus in us. Let's climb a tree, get out on a limb, get out of our comfort zone, and Jesus will go home with us. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. One of the greatest prophetic words God ever gave me. It rules my life. Philip, you, you, you will either get comfortable in the realm of risk or you'll lose everything in the realm of comfort. You me say that again? You must become comfortable in the realm of risk or you'll lose everything in the realm of... Get out of your comfort zone. Don't be a participator, be a spectator. Don't be a customer, be a servant. Get out of your comfort zone. That's where the miracles are. It's where the breakthrough is. All the stuff you're believing God for right now, it ain't in your comfort zone. It's not going to happen in your comfort zone. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. We're, we're minutes away from all of us getting out of our comfort zone because you know what we're going to do to end this service? We're not going to gather at that wall in Israel, but we're going to gather in this altar. And we're going to pray and ask God for that greater and it ain't about somebody, it ain't about getting in a line or somebody laying hands on you, which that's wonderful. That's not what today's about. It's about us coming together as a family and, and asking God and crying out for that greater. Lord. But it's going to require you getting out of your comfort zone. Third word, last one. It's a word we don't really associate with that story much, but it's a word I love. It's the word honor. Turn to somebody, say honor. So much, of that, uh, so much of that marriage, wedding, had so much to do with the word honor. Got to understand, when, when, when she came up to Jesus and she said they've run out of wine, it, it was fixing to get bad. Because if they run out of wine, that's going to be the story of that day. People are going to go home, and, and instead of talking about how beautiful of a wedding it is, what are they going to say? Oh my gosh, they ran out of wine. It was so embarrassing. The bride and groom would have been humiliated. The families would have been humiliated. Mary would have been humiliated. The governor would have been humiliated. That would have been the talk of the town. They ran out of wine. Jesus stepped in and saved the day. And when he did what he did, he took honor to a place that had never been seen before. 
The governor felt so honored that they had saved the best for last. He calls the groom over. He goes, my gosh, look what y'all have done. Y'all saved the best for last. And he honored the groom and the bride. And all of a sudden their chest is swelling and big, you know, and then in honoring them, the families were honored, right? And then everybody there heard what he said. And so they were honored. And then because Mary had authority at the wedding, she had to have had authority because she told the servants what to do, correct? So you got the families looking over at Mary and Mary was honored. And then she looks at Jesus and the disciples look at Jesus because they're the only ones that really knew what had happened. And they're all looking at Jesus going. And Jesus was. And then what do you think he did? He lifted his head. Who did he honor? The whole story's about honor. To the point where the most famous wedding in the history of the world was that one. The most famous six water pots in the history of the world are, are those. And the most famous wine in the history of the world is, is what wine? That wine. Honor. I love Laura's definition of honor. You know, we do a lot of marriage seminars coming out with a new book here in the first few weeks called The Path. It's on marriage. It's a big part of our ministry. And when Laura's talking to women about honoring your husband, and where, where's all the ladies at? Come on, let me hear from you, girls. This is what she'll tell y'all. Honoring your husband. It's about appreciating your husband for everything he is and not stumbling over what, all, everything he's not. Why can't we be that way with one another? Come on, honor is, is appreciating everything we are, but not stumbling over everything we're not. That's honor. So when you think of honor, you go, well, you know, we should be honoring Pastor Sam and Pastor Becky. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. We should be honoring the leadership of this church. Absolutely. But we should also be honoring everyone. Yeah, but, but, but not so-and-so. I mean, they're really living bad. Right? No, no, no. We can honor the potential in them. We can honor the destiny in them. We can honor, come on, who God's called them to be and what God's called them to do. We got, there needs to be a river of honor that flows in our churches because, listen, honor is the atmosphere that brings that glory. We've got to honor this altar. Religion has taken away our altars from us. Nobody wants to come down to the altar. So they come down to the altar and so say, I think something's wrong with me. Well, newsflash, everybody knows something's wrong with you. <laughs> Pastor Becky, we go to secular concerts. We get there an hour early and we fill it up from the front to the back. We come to church 30 minutes late and fill it up from the back to the front. There's not going to be a revival in our churches until there's a first a revival in this altar. So year, years ago, the Lord told me this. Exalt the altar, God will exalt the church. Fill the altar, God will fill the church. Honor the altar, God will honor the church. We got to learn to honor the moment. One of the things people don't get it about the miracle ministry of Jesus is when he was ministered to somebody, he was in the moment. He wasn't thinking about anything else. He was, in, everybody say, in the moment. You want the glory? We, every Sunday, every Wednesday, out, you got to be in the moment. You can't be thinking about where you're going to eat lunch here in the next few minutes. What I got to do later. We got to be, this, this, this moment that we're in right now, it'll never happen again. It's like a snowflake. And we've got to honor this moment. But also right now, from the back to the front, there is a voice. There is a voice that's talking to you right now about getting out of your comfort zone. And we've got to honor that voice. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Honor is the ground miracles come forth from. Honor is the air that miracles breathe and come to life. Honor is the river that miracles move in. 
focus, risk, honor. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Feel led of the Holy Ghost to ask you three questions. And then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get down to this altar and we're going we're gonna to reach out with our faith and grab hold of that greater glory. Listen, the glory of God's always been in this church from day one. But we're all believing God for a greater glory. Everything I preach today, it begins, begins with knowing, knowing something and knowing that if you died tomorrow, you'd bust heaven wide open. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you say, Brother Phil, I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't have that 100% knowing. I hope I'm saved. I think I'm saved. I think I'm a pretty good person, but I, I don't have a knowing. I don't have that 100% knowing, but I want that. I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I died tomorrow for whatever reason, I would bust heaven wide open. All over this building, if you want to know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I'm not going to embarrass you, but all over this building, just lift your hands up all over the building right now. All over the building, lift your hands up. Thank you, Father. Hands everywhere. Hands everywhere. Hands everywhere. Just a few more seconds. You want to know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you're going to spend eternity with Him. Lift your hands in this place. Come on, just a few more seconds. So many hands in this place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can put your hands down. Keep your eyes closed. If you're here this morning and you say, Brother Philip, I'm going to be honest with you. The comfort zone has been defining me. And I need to get out of my comfort zone. I need to climb a tree and get out on a limb. That comfort zone has been wearing me out. And I know everything I'm looking for, the miracles, the breakthroughs, spiritually, physically, financially, they're not in my comfort zone. I can't let a chair define my Christianity. All over this building, if that's you, lift your hands everywhere, you know who you are. Hands going up everywhere. Hands going up everywhere. Now every head up, every eye open. Everybody look up here. I'm going to put my hands up first. I believe we're in the last days. I believe we're living in perilous times, dangerous times, prophetic times. I want to be a believer. I believe y'all want to be a church that ushers in that greater glory in these last days. If you feel that way, come on, lift your hands all over this place. If Life United is a church that is going to usher in, usher, that's the Holy Ghost word right there. Usher, usher in that greater glory in this house. Come on, lift your hands in this place. Woo! This is what I want to do, and I don't care what it looks like, but we're going to do it. Because if this altar is packed, heaven will be packed. But I want, if you lifted your hands, if you didn't lift your hands, I want us all to gather down at the altar. Come on, get out of your comfort zone. Come on, Zacchaeus, climb a tree, get out on a limb. Can we, can we put that picture of the wailing wall up there? Because that's where we're going. Get in tight. This is a big altar. That's why I love this church. I, I go into churches now, they don't hardly have an altar. Let's pack it out. This church is never going to be the same. A great season ends and a greater season begins. Listen, all over this country, there's puddle churches and there's river churches. There's shallow churches and there's deep churches. Everything about Life United, the heritage, the legacy of this place is His glory. God hadn't called this place to be a puddle. He's called it to be a river. Psalms 42, 7, my favorite scripture. Deep is calling unto. Come on, it's getting tight and I like it. And just fill, this, fill the aisles up. We're not going to be able to all get down here, but that's all right. You're out of your comfort zone. You've walked away from your chair and found your place. Everybody pray this prayer with me. Everybody say, Father, I love you. 
Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. All my sins, all my guilt, regret, disobedience, washed away in the blood of Jesus. Jesus, I'm forgiven. Jesus, you live in my heart. Jesus, I'm saved. I'm born again. And in this moment, I boldly declare, Jesus is Lord of my life. I'm gonna be who he's called me to be. I'm gonna do what he's called me to do. Jesus, you lead and I'll follow. I'm coming out of my comfort zone. Come on, let's begin to cry out for the glory of God. Come on, lift your hands in this place. Begin to cry out for the glory of God. A greater glory in the house. A greater glory in your house. Moses cried out in Exodus 33, 18, show me your glory. Father, today in the name of Jesus, let it be orchestrated by the Holy Ghost. Father, show us your glory today. Father, let there be a greater glory that abides in the house from this day forward. Ooh. Come on, when you say those words, holy, it's like, it's like you're fanning, fanning that flame. Come on, holy. Come on, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Come on, somebody cry out for glory. The glory of God in America. The glory of God in Shreveport. The glory of God at Life United. The glory of God in Florida right now with Pastor Sam. The glory of God with Paul and Debbie in 40 Texas. Father, we cry out for your glory in this place. A greater glory. A greater season. Come on, begin to just, begin to declare that a revival has taken place in this altar. Woo! Father, we declare a revival in this altar. We declare the glory in this altar. The river is running in this altar. Father, the greatest manifestations of people getting saved, healed, the gifts of the Spirit in this altar are the days ahead, not the days behind. Father, thank you for your glory. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your glory in this place. Everybody be real still. Be real quiet. Just stand, just be still and know that he's God for a moment. Our God is a consuming fire. And that warmth is being felt and our lives have been illuminated. But that fire also burns, and it burns away the dross, it burns away the yoke, it burns away the curses, it burns away the burdens. It burns away all that junk that will keep you from reaching out and receiving what Jesus provided for you at Calvary with your faith. Now listen to me carefully. Be real still. Don't move. Some of you need to hear this more than others. But God's heart is Psalms 103.3 who forgives all our iniquities, who heals us of all of our diseases. And I'm telling you right now, every one of you in here are forgiven. The blood of Jesus has washed everything away. Don't bring that stuff up to Jesus anymore. He don't know what you're talking about. You're forgiven. But as much as you've been forgiven, be real still, you're also healed. You just don't know it yet. You're healed. While you were, while you were worshiping God, Come on, Calvary snuck up on you and healed you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Y'all heard the term dead man walking? Y'all are healed people standing. Just be real still in this place. Everyone, 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 everyone. All things are possible if we'll believe. God's not doing anything. It's already done, 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 done. Religion is due. Christianity is done. You're forgiven, but just as much as you're forgiven, you're healed. And just as much as you're healed, you're forgiven. If any minister ever understood that, it was T.L. Osborne. You're healed. You're 
healed. The only thing left for you to do is do what that lady didn't do. Now be real still. I'm going to count to three. And you're going to begin to move every inch of your body. And when you do, you're going to be utterly astounded because all the pain, all the soreness, all the stiffness is going to be gone. The arthritis is going to be gone. What you couldn't do, now you can. And you're going to begin to move. And the more you move, the more you're going to want to move. And the more you move, the more you're not going to be able to help it. You're going to begin to lift up the mighty name of Jesus. Because I'm telling you, Brother Philip Baker does not have a healing ministry. What I have is an anointing that helps people reach out with their faith and receive what's already been provided. Make sure you give him the glory. Y'all ready to find out what he's done? You're going to be blown away. I'm going to count to three and then do what that woman didn't do. Whatever you got to move, you move. It's different for each and every one of you. Y'all ready? One. Give Jesus the glory. Two, don't you hesitate. Three, move your body in this place. Bend over, touch your toes. Move your neck around. Move your arms around. Move your wrists around. Move your ankles. Come on, twist and shout a little bit. Come on now. Breathe in through your nose. Come on, move. Come on, somebody lift up the name of Jesus. Move your jaw around. Check out your lungs. Come on, move those knees, those ankles, those toes, those feet. Come on, put all your weight on that toe. It don't hurt no more. Come on, all the pain's gone. All the soreness is gone. Come on, move a little bit more. Let me show me some arms. Come on, work those shoulders a little bit. Come on, lift your hands up all the way up over your head. You don't even know when you couldn't do that last. Hallelujah. Woo! Now watch this. This will be fun. This will be like popcorn. If all the pain, all the soreness, all the stiffness is gone, you're sitting there and you're like, OMG. It's all gone. All over this place. If that's you, just lift your hands everywhere. Lift your hands everywhere. Pain's gone. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Keep them up. Keep them up. Lift your hands in this place. Okay, don't take them down. I don't know if I'll be able to get to all of you. Somebody, if you just... Somebody jump up here. Where's Jeffrey? Jump up here and just count all these hands that are up. All right, everybody make eye contact with me. When I point at you, put your hand down and just yell my back, my neck like popcorn. Y'all ready? Give me somebody. Yeah, right here. What? Your hips. Your knee. Your whole body. Shoulder. Back. Knee. Your knees. Right back there. Shoulder. Shoulder. Everything. What's that? Your neck, your shoulder, your knee, your feet. Yeah, right here. Your hands, right here. Right leg, your feet, your eye. Come on. Hands, hand, neck, everything, everything. What's that? Your back. Come on, man, fist bump that thing. Bam. All right, here we go. What, what did God do? Your, your feet. What about you, brother? Your lungs. What's that? Severe. Severe. Go free. Peace. I see it in your face. What? What, babe? What, brother? Yeah. Your shoulder. Your back. Your what's that? Healed. Amen. Yeah. Knee. Neck. Your feet. Come on, look at that for you. you. Back. What about you? Neck and back. Your shoulder. Which shoulder was it? That one? What can you? What's that? Blood pressure. Absolutely. You can feel that stuff. Your mind. Yeah, Joe. Your wrist. You need a wrist with all that mess you picking up. Yeah, brother. Elbow. Your ear. Nerve pain. Come on, lift your hands in this place. Father, thank you for your glory. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your glory. Jeffrey, come up here and get close to me. A greater glory. Come on, a greater glory. A greater glory. A greater glory. Come on, can there be... Father, put a cry in our heart for a greater glory. Father, put a cry in the heart 
of life united for a greater glory. You got to walk out of here more laser focused than you ever have been. It's going to require risk. Got to get out of your comfort zone. That comfort zone is taking away your lunch money. Your comfort zone's bullying you. Comfort zone's keeping you on the sidelines. And it's going to keep you from being right in the middle of what God's doing in these last days. My gosh, a river of honor in this place. For your pastors, yes. For leadership, yes. But for people, for the altar, for the moment. Don't ever take a moment for granted. This is not just another church service. Wednesday night is not just another Wednesday night service. Next Sunday is not just another Sunday. Gotta honor the moment. Jesus is coming back soon. We got work to do. I, I don't want to be a believer that's waiting around to be rescued by the rapture. And I think if this has shown us anything today, it's that it doesn't have to be spectacular. to be supernatural I don't want to be the spectacular preacher I'd like to be extremely boring and what happens in your life be incredibly supernatural because that way Jesus gets all the Come on, one more time. Greater glory. Come on, ask it. Give God some praise. Amen. Come on. Thank you, Father. It's all for you, God. All about you. We trust you. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask you as you can to make your way back to your seat. Make your way back to your seat. I've got just a few things for you. Love what Pastor Philip said. In the moment, you're in the moment. Be ready for those moments. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just make your way back to your seat. How many of you thankful you came today? Amen. Isn't it funny? Sometimes you don't know what to expect until you know what to expect. <laughs> Amen. Love it. Hey, just want to encourage you uh, again. Uh, if you haven't had the chance, if I hadn't had a chance to connect with you, my name is Jeffrey. I'm the student pastor here. I take care of our students, seventh through twelfth grade. And so I know some of you guys, when you were down here, man, Pastor Philip was saying, you know, what is it? Your shoulders, your eyes. Some of you at this altar, you gave your life back to Christ. Can we give them a hand clap? Amen. We celebrate that. All right. L listen, I just want to remind you, that's not the end. And we're here to help you take that next step. We want to help you know what's next. And so in the seat back in front of you is the card. At the bottom, it says, I'm ready for my next steps. You just fill that out, and you're going to place it in the offer container as you leave the service. Also, we want to make sure that we honor uh, 
the people who stand in this pulpit. So we want to honor Pastor Philip um, before you leave. So if you um, brought an offering, even if you hadn't pre- haven't prepared one now, if you're using the offering envelope, you can write special uh, on it. You can place that in the offering container. As always, we have our app and we have online. You can uh, designate it that way and go on. So make sure you give. Remember what Pastor Sam said Wednesday night, faith does what? It gives right? Faith gives. It has action. It does something. And so to segue into that, some of you guys, uh, when you leave today, some of you have already bought a fish plate ticket. If you have, raise your hand. If you already bought a plate ticket, hey, thank you so much. Give these guys a hand clap. Thank you so much. Because what you did was you didn't just buy fish. What you just did was you invested in a student for eternity. You just sent a young person to camp where they can hear about Jesus more, where they can get set free, where they can get put on the right track. And some of you are like, man, I want to be a part of that. Awesome. I got a chance for you too, even if you didn't buy a ticket. As soon as service is over, head over to the student building. You'll know it because we got the loud music playing. Uh, But we've got fish plates over there. So if you have a ticket, there is a table that says tickets. You can just drop your tickets off there and get your plate. If you haven't purchased one yet, uh, we can take cash, check, credit card. Make sure you go over there and do that as well. Uh, Some of you like, I don't even like fish. That's fine. But you want to uh, invest and you want to give towards a student, you can do that over there and make a donation as well. So please don't leave before you stop over there. It's first come, first serve. If you don't have a ticket, uh, we'll sell out, but we'll send some students to camp. Can you say amen? All right. So I love you. If you'll stand with me, we'll get ready to dismiss you guys. Don't forget as well, uh, Pastor Philip, you've got a table out in the lobby as well. Make sure you stop by the table Check out all of it. I'll say this, uh, incredible family. Uh, They were my children's pastors when I was 11 years old. So a lot of connection. Um, But just to to see everything that they're doing and know that they had an impact in my life, truly, truly tremendous. So I love you guys. Make sure, stop by the table, give in the offer container, stop by, get a fish plate, give towards camp. We love you guys. We will see you next week. You are dismissed.